This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum. Here in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicide, where everyday object, a magazine, a cigarette lighter, a student's lamp, a paperweight, all are touched by murder. <laughs> It's a familiar object, handwritten, rather good bond paper. No imprint on the top, merely a date. A simple, single initial for the signature. Do you notice the same thing about this letter that I do, sir? Rather a well-formed handwriting? More than that. This letter was written by an educated person. A very well-educated person. But for what a purpose? Well, today, that letter can be seen in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. Museum of Murder. Yes, interred in this place are countless memories represented by the objects on these shelves and these cabinets. Memories of terror, horror in the night, of the ultimate cruelty between man and man, the killing of one human being by another. Yes, here lies death. In serried, endless ranks, pitiful instruments, not only guns and knives and poisons and the cords of the garroters, but the simple things, spoons and cups and even, yes, here, for instance, is a baby's pacifier, complete with the ivory ring. Horrible, isn't it? Because dropped in a bedroom, it led to a woman who was a nurse. Dropped in a bedroom, it took that woman up the 13 steps to a hangman's noose. Here's the letter. The letter I told you about. The letter of today's story. This one begins innocently enough in a bank. As a man steps to a teller's window. Will you catch this for me, please? Do we not, sir? I have an account here. You can check the signature. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, that'll take just a moment. So normal, so much in the ordinary course of daily business. The cashier goes to the files, compares the signature and the check with that on file, returns to his wicket. Everything seems to be in order, sir. How do you wish the money? Two fives, the rest in one pound notes. Very well. Uh, there you are, sir. If you'll count. The customer counts the bills nods that they come to the proper amount and walks away out of the bank. A week or so later, in the office of the manager of that bank... Of course, we understand how you feel, Mr. Holt. Mm. The cashier in question will be here in just a moment. One would expect a bank to protect a depositor with more care. Three forged checks, each one successively larger. Apparently, the forger felt himself safer each time. Apparently. If I hadn't requested my statement and the voucher ahead of time this month, this might have gone on almost indefinitely. Mr. Holt drums his fingers angrily on the manager's desk. Both men sit silently, awaiting the arrival of the cashier. You sent for me, sir? Uh, yes, Hollingsworth. Your initials are on these three vouchers. Do you remember the man who cashed these? Yes, sir. A uh, quiet sort. Very dark. Seemed on the tallish side. Nothing at all like the gentleman sitting here. Oh, not at all. Ah, I see. Well, this gentleman is Mr. Holt. Mm. But... But I compared the signature, sir. Our usual routine. Is this a case for the police, sir? It certainly is. And I intend to see to it that the police find the perpetrator of this forgery. Forgery. And apparently quite a clever job of it. After all, the cashier did compare the signatures, and the cashier was honest. No question about that. What then did Scotland Yard have to say about it? May I ask, Mr. Holt, if you've written any letters recently to anyone you don't know? I'm a solicitor, Inspector. I have a great deal of correspondence. Of course. Let me ask you something else. Have you made any debt collections within, say, the past six weeks? Well, now, let me think. Yes, there was that Mr. Arthur. He'd had a bit of a difficulty with Mr. Harris. Asked me to write a letter. Uh, a lawyer's letter, you understand, Inspector? Yes, of course. Go on, sir. I wrote the letter. Mr. Harris paid his debt at once. About 50 pounds it was. I deducted the usual fee and remitted the balance to Mr. Arthur, that was all. But you signed the letter yourself? Of course. It's not a new trick. 
but it's been used quite often lately. I really don't follow you, Inspector. That's how the forger obtained your signature to trace or copy. What? But that's... Quite simple. Yes. And the chances are that neither your Mr. Arthur, whom you saw, nor Mr. Harris, whom you did not see, neither one of them was the forger, as we've come to call him. Then you had similar cases? Many of them. And no trace of the culprit? Never a trace, nor any link. He knows what he's doing, this fellow. Clever, in a diabolical sort of way. Clever, in a diabolical sort of way. Well, you can fight this sort of cleverness with only two weapons. Patience and vigilance. Sergeant Burke here of the yard was both patient and vigilant. Stationed in a bank as one of the searches for the forger. The sergeant heard... Will you cash this, please? The name is Forsyth. Beg pardon? Aren't you James Olsey? My name is Forsyth. Sorry, I saw you identified in the Mason case. Your name is Olsey. I'll have to ask you to come with me. I could the enter. sergeant took Mr. Halsey to the yard. There, Inspector Dodson proceeded to the questioning. You knew that check was a forgery, didn't you, Halsey? No, sir, I didn't. I see. You were just doing a busy man a favor, running to the bank to cash a check for him. That's it. Exactly right, Inspector. He promised me half a quid. He did for me trouble. I can hardly believe that. You, with your record, trusted like that? Some folks trust me. No doubt. Any questions, sergeant? Yes, sir. Look here, Halsey. Where were you supposed to deliver the money? Carter and Company Limited, Queensbury Building, to Mr. Forsyth. Same name as was on that cheque. That's all I know. Except I'm out half a quid and in trouble besides. No use, Sergeant. There'll be no Forsyth of Carter and Company. Let this fellow go. He's telling the truth for once. The man we want is the forger. Another blank. No link to the man whose mind was planning all this cleverness. Of course, they did learn one more fact about his operation. <laughs> Just before we close the file, I think we might check up and see if we can learn anything from the real Mr. Forsyth. Yes? Oh, uh, I'm a police officer. My credentials, ma'am. Oh, I expect you want to see my husband. Well, if you please, ma'am, we're making a few inquiries. Yes, come in. Thank you. We've had nothing but visits from the police ever since this forgery business. As if it wasn't bad enough already with the burglary last month and all that. What was that? The burglary, did you say, ma'am? That's right. There's a policeman to see you, dear. Oh, good evening. What can I do to help you? Well, I think your wife has already supplied the answer to the question I was going to ask you, Mr. Forsyth. I understand you had a burglary last month. That's right, but there was nothing much stolen, just a few trinkets, nothing valuable. Oh, anything else? Why, yes. Don't remember, dear. They took your checkbook. Oh, yes, yes. Rather silly things, you. No, sir. Not so silly as you'd think. Oh, here are the particulars, sir. Thank you. Have you compared them with the information we have already on the forgery case? Yes, sir. The check that Halsey tried to cash came from the stolen book. Who was this forger? This mind which covered all trails to itself? Somewhere... Somehow, the correct thread which would lead to the center of his web must be picked up somewhere. I believe some money has been pressed to my credit here from my bank in London. The name is Harrison, Charles Harrison. I'll see Mr. Harrison. Just a moment, please. You know how this is done, of course. You deposit money in one bank in, say, London. Notice the draft is sent at the depositor's request to a branch of the same bank in another city. You arrive in that city, identify yourself, and receive your money. Usually it's a fair amount, too large to travel with. How much is this draft of yours, sir? 250 pounds. The amount's correct. It was deposited in our London office by Mr. Harris Thompson. That's right. With instructions to pay to him in person. I'm here. You wish identification? I have it. But you're Mr. Harrison. Charles Harrison, you said so a moment ago. I'm Harris Thompson. I see. Perhaps the London branch made a mistake. I'll get in touch with them and come back tomorrow. Sorry to have bothered you. I caught your signal, Barclay. Is something wrong? That fellow there, sir. Just going out the door. Gave me two different names while he was trying to collect on this class. Some kind of swindle? I can't say, sir. The order came down from London in perfectly good order. There are 250 pounds up there. It's, uh, well, it, it's a bit strange. And he behaves oddly. 
stated name and territory. Quite simple. Quite simple, really. Money had been deposited in London. The man who was to draw it in Yarmouth would thereby acquire the appearance and reputation of wealth and honesty. When he returned with a new forged draft, it would be honoured. A neat scheme. But the fellow mixed up the names. The Yarmouth Bank reported to the Yard. Inspector Dodson came calling. We'll get out a pickup order. It might be well worth our while to talk with this Harrison Thompson, whatever his name is. Yes? Does Mr. Harris Thompson live here? What name? Harris Thompson. No, doesn't live here. Oh, that's a pity. I had something for him. Oh, what was that? Something important. Could you leave it? Well, no. I've got to give it to him in person. Uh, confidential, you see. Oh. Well, wait a minute. Yes? What do you want? Are you Mr. Harris Thompson? Who are you? Never mind who I am, Mr. Harris Thompson. I have a warrant for your arrest. My name isn't Harris Thompson. That's something we know already, Mr. Rafe. All right, Rafe. You trip yourself. You know that now. My name is Harris Thompson. Stop it, Rafe. Your fingerprints are in file and criminal records. We know your name. My name is Harris Thompson. It'll go a lot easier with you if you admit the truth. My name is Harris Thompson. And that's all you'll say? My name is... All right. We've heard it before. Lock him up, Sergeant. The charge will be attempted fraud and last. Come along, Rafe. Perhaps you'll change your mind. With Rafe Harrison Thompson safely away in the Yarmouth jail, Inspector Dodson, in company with several Yarmouth policemen and the manager of the bank, visited the man's lodging. I must say, Inspector, when you search a place, you are quite thorough. Just a routine, sir. Does this make any sense to you? Dear friend, there is no doubt your error at the bank, while understandable, was quite grave. However, I expect to rectify it shortly. The bank has requested that Mr. Thompson come there personally to sign a new bit of paper, giving Mr. Harrison permission to withdraw the money in Yarmouth. I will explain later exactly what I want you to do. In the meanwhile, do not come up to London. Caution has always been, and always will be, my watchword. Trust me, sincerely yours, Jay. While this fellow is describing our regular procedure, where identification is in doubt. I see. Do you notice the same thing about this letter that I do, sir? Rather a well-formed handwriting. More than that. This letter was written by an educated person. A very well-educated person. But for what a purpose? Yes, the phrasing is simple, but the words he uses, it's, it's a little difficult to understand, isn't it? Why someone with education would involve himself in something like this? Well, when we find Jay, we may have an answer to that. In the meantime, I think we may have our first direct link to the forger. Well, today, as I told you, that self-same letter can be seen in its place in the Black Museum. signed simply J, told nothing new. The manner and style of its writing told many things. This J, possibly the long-sought forger, was a man of education and intelligence. A shadow figure using many other men to further his own designs. Seemed a kind of devil. But within a very few days, they learned he was at least a man. So my cousin Rafe is in trouble, again. Yes, Mrs. Webster, and we would like to know the occasion of his visiting you. I haven't seen him in ten years. My own aunt's son, and not in ten years. And most of which he spent commuting back and forth in and out of prison. Why do you suppose he turned up now? He wanted something. First I thought he turned a new leaf, but he wanted something. A convenience. He'd taken a room in Yarmouth. Would I, he says, receive his mail for him? And you did? Yes, Inspector, I did. May I see whatever you have left of it? I haven't anything. Rafe's friend came and asked for all his mail. His friend? Yes, sir. And how a man like that came to be friends with Rafe, I'll never understand. Well-dressed, nice-looking, and with a real refined manner. Could you describe this man, Mrs. Webster? I had a good look at him. Even talked to him. 
fair as she was. Brown hair, nice blue eyes. About, well, my husband's size, and he's five foot eight. Weighs about 170 pounds. A nice mouth. And I'll wager his hand never held a pick or shovel. The second link, a description. Apparently a man of some means. Not particularly individualized, of course, but still, he was someone who could identify this Jay when he'd been found. As for Rafe, his fate was settled quickly. Rafe Martin, you have been convicted of fraud, attempted fraud, and conspiracy to commit fraud. Have you anything to say before sentence is pronounced? What for, Your Lordship? Your mind's made up. Nothing I will say can change it. Very well. As you seem to be the dupe of someone with a great deal more intelligence than yourself, I've been tempted to lighten your punishment. However, your intransigent attitude towards the law enforcement officers in this case, your attitude in court, and your past record removed all such temptations. You are about to be committed to prison for the maximum time the law allows. Twenty years hard labor. That is all. Underling, a dupe, went to prison. Shortly after his arrival there in Dartmoor, Rafe had a visitor in his cell. Surprised, Rafe? Only if you were to be my cellmate? Hardly that. But I may have the key which will unlock that door before you expect. I make no deals with coppers. Twenty years is a long time. You'll be an old man when you get out. What of it? In fact, twenty years may be a life sentence for you. Nothing I can do about it, isn't there? I think you know exactly what you can do about it. I don't talk. Your friend Jay didn't help you much in court, did he? Why should he? I don't think you owe him anything. Chances are he had the lion's share of all your little dealings, and now he's free to go right on while you're in here. Think about it, Rafe. If you change your mind, the water... Rafe thought about it. Honor among thieves. Uh, up to a point, perhaps. But the cold, bleak winter at Dartmoor was beyond that point. At least for Rafe. All right, Inspector. But what's in it for me? I think your sentence will be considerably reduced. You were convicted in three counts, Rafe. The time for each might be made to run concurrently instead of consecutively, without too much difficulty. Is it a deal? Well, I can't promise. You know how such things are, Rafe. All right, I'll chance it. <laughs> you never get him otherwise. He's too smart. He's a lawyer. What? That's right. Knows all the ins and outs, he does. Laughs all the time when another fellow's being fooled. He's laughing at me right now. You've seen him, then? I've seen him. What's his name? Or don't you know? Oh, I know all right. But he doesn't know I found it out. Followed him home one night. Had his name on his doorbell. I can be bright at times myself. Yes? Mrs. Seaforth? Mrs. Joseph Seaforth? I'm Mrs. Seaforth. Is your husband at home? I'm sorry, no. Would you care to leave your name? We're from Scotland Yard, madam. We have a warrant for your husband's arrest. Arrest? Joe, but what can he have done? That's a long story, ma'am. It's taken us quite some time to track him this far. When do you expect him back? That's it, sir. I don't know. He went out of town on business a week ago. I haven't heard from him since. He's never done anything like this before, never. Gone. Joseph Seaforth, the forger, disappeared. But there are certain rules of thumb the police follow in situations like this. They know what happens when the wanted notices appear in the post offices all over the country. Now remember, I want every lead that comes in followed through. We're dealing with a very tricky customer and every piece of information, however small, may be helpful. Yes, I knew him all right. He used to come into the bar for a drink often enough. He was a real gentleman. Distinguished looking. Oh, have you seen him recently? No. Haven't seen him for months. That's his face, all right. Recognize it anywhere. Took a room at our house for a couple of months. Not that we saw much of him. Oh, when did he leave? About six months ago. And you haven't seen him since? No. No, so far, William, I'm confident that somewhere, sometime, somebody who's seen that wanted notice is going to meet up with Seaforth again. 
Hello there, Mr. Seaforth. But uh, my name's not Seaforth. It's Saunders. It's Seaforth, all right. And mine's Alsey. Jack Alsey. One of the fellas you pretty near got into trouble, like you got Rafe Martin into trouble. I'll appreciate it if Don't you... Don't waste your breath. Your picture's up, see? And a right good likeness it is, too. Oh. All right. I am Joseph Seaforth. And now that you know, how do you like to make some money with me? Money? How? I have a check. Uh, it's a good one. Uh, will you cash it for me? What kind of knock do you think I am? Once burnt, twice shy. That's me every time. We've reason to believe, Halsey, that you've seen Seaforth. What if I have, Inspector? We want to know where. Why should I tell you? I would if I were you. We have enough on you to make you rather uncomfortable for a fair amount of time. All right, I saw him in a pub in Whitechapel. He hangs about down there a lot, I hear. Pass the word, Sergeant. We know Seaforth's in Whitechapel somewhere. Circulate his description to all stations. And, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Put the pigeons onto it, Sergeant. They'll know a lot more about him a lot faster than we will. Seaforth seems to frequent two places more than others, Inspector. The Dancing Bear and the Monument. Well, he's getting a trifle careless, isn't he? With all his cleverness, he ought to have known better than that. The search had narrowed now. Two pubs in Whitechapel. The inspector and Sergeant Berkey dropped in at the Dancing Bear for a quiet pint. Do this again, will you, landlord? Very well, sir. We seem to be drawing a blank here, inspector. So far, yes. We'll wait a bit. There you are. There you are. Thank you, sir. By the way, we happen to be waiting for a fella, perhaps you know him, name is Seaforth. Never heard of him. We don't ask names in here. One man's money is as good as another, as long as you don't cause trouble. That's the only way to stay in business. The inspector and the sergeant finished their ale. They lingered briefly, then... All right, sergeant. We'll go now. They left. Outside the door, the inspector turned back. Watch the landlord, sergeant, through the window. I see him, sir. He's heading for the back room. Come along, Sergeant, before our man gets out of the back door. The far door, sir. Mm. On the right-hand side. Good enough. And uh, thanks. I'll be on my way. How are you, Mr. Seaforth? Huh? You're barking up the wrong tree, couple. This man's name is Saunders. Stay out of this, landlord. If you want to stay in business. My name is Saunders. And if you are the police, it's hardly necessary for you to molest decent citizens. It's no good, Seaforth. I think you know that. We have a warrant. And your fingerprints from your own apartment. Uh, all right, Seaforth. It's finished now. Perhaps one day you'll tell us why you did it. The law can be very dull. When you know it and turn it on itself, there's excitement of a sort. Perhaps one day you'll tell me how you picked up the proper thread. It doesn't matter very much at the moment. And the silent witness to that whole story is today in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. The trial of Joseph Seaforth was swift. One somewhat strange incident did occur, strange in the light of the man's background, previous experience. Throughout the trial, he made no effort to defend himself. He seemed quite ready to accept whatever punishment was determined for him. And then, as the judge was about to pronounce sentence, Seaforth requested the record of his case. He wished, he said, to enter objections to what he felt was inadmissible evidence. The judge denied the request on the grounds that the objection should have been made before the verdict was announced. So Joseph Seaforth went to prison for 20 years. And it was never determined why the lawyer in him awoke only when it was too late. And now until next time, till we meet in the same place and I tell you another story about the Black Museum, I remain as always obediently yours.